Welcome, Dr. Samina Rahman is a board certified OBGYN with a practice tailored to meet the needs of women for gynecologic and cosmetic services. Dr. Rahman is one of the few physicians nationally to receive the designation of ISWISH Fellow, that is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, and she is actively involved with cutting edge approaches to sexual pain and sexual dysfunction. She's also an active member of the International Pelvic Pain Society and specializes in a multidisciplinary approach to chronic pelvic pain. Dr. Rahman is a menopause and sex medicine specialist, and she has an academic affiliation with Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Her private practice is in downtown Chicago. Welcome again, Dr. Samina Rahman, to the Alloy community. Yay! So, thank you yay! For me, so glad to see love you. Alloy. I love all the docs and Alloy. I love you. So oh, that's let's awesome. Do this. Thank you. Um, mm. So we're talking today about sexual health and the challenges that face many women physically, hormonally, um, and also connecting that piece with culture, conservative upbringings, taboos, mm. religion. Mm. So as we listen to you today, I'd love for you to speak to and about women who may be facing one or both of those sides of the coin, if that makes sense. And if you would kick us off and share as much of your personal story as you like, just to kind of thread the needle for us about your experience and how it informs your work. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be on this webinar with Alloy. I love the company and I love, uh, you know, everyone employed and working with it. So um, it's a very evidence driven um, company, which is very important because you don't want snake oil. <laughs> we call it. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, so uh, I am a, I, I grew up actually, I'm South Asian, I'm Pakistani uh, and Muslim. I was born in America. My parents are immigrants. And so obviously that's really loaded if you think about like a first generation uh, immigrant family coming into America and how I think there is this desire full fledged to kind of hold on to some cultural aspects of your life. And being Muslim, you know, traditionally you hear or think of about, um, you know, the culture around Islam to be very socially and sexually conservative as many religions are. Uh, I, re I just did a Ishwish talk um, at the fall course about religion and sexuality. And, at, and my one of my slides was, all of these religions have this in common. And around of it was like, sex is stigmatized, sex is uh, premarital, sex is bad, you know, uh, sex out of marriage is that. So all the religions kind of hold this and obviously interpretations change and people evolve in terms of how um, they look at their own religion and their relationship with uh, spirituality and, 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 you know, how they review religiosity in general. But obviously, you know, having that background and I then I, on top of that, I grew up in the South. And so, right. you know, when my parents came in, you know, they were they my dad landed in Mississippi from Pakistan. So <laughs> go figure. <laughs> but I actually grew up in North Carolina. But this was like, you know, you know, even, even like way before I was born, like it was kind of a period of time when, you know, there weren't that many you know people that looked like me around. Yeah. So, you know, you even you even try harder to grasp onto your own cultural narrative and all that stuff. So. What I think is really important is just looking at how, um, you know, our upbringing affects how we, we kind of align with sexuality, right? Like how we look at sex is really much consistent with how, you know, we're brought up. What are the, what are the parameters and, and, and how we look at sex in general? And so there's the issue of, you know, how your parents raised you, how your religion looks at it, how your culture looks at it, right? And then on top of that, you have these nuances in how you navigate the midlife process and how this happens too, right? Like, so you end up with less estrogen, you end up with less um, of the testosterone, all these changes happen. And all of a sudden you're dealing with, um, you know, biological factors, right? We know when it comes to sexual health, there's a biopsychosocial approach, right? So the biology is, okay, my hormones are changing. I have less estrogen. I have less testosterone. Um, the, the social aspects are around your relationship with who, whomever you choose to have, you know, any kind of sexual relationship with, right? And as well as, um, you know, the sociology of, of the social aspects about how you view culture, religion, and how that intersection plays into your, um, how you see sex and the taboo around it, right? The taboo around it, 
like I said, I grew up in the South. I'm, I'm brown. I am Muslim. All of these kind of like stacked up against my education in sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a big education gap is what we're talking about. We're talking about these huge education gaps that we have, you know, you're, most of us get sex ed in school. I would grow up in the South. How does that relate to what sex ed I got? Very little, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm a gynecologist who, you know, also experienced my own issues with sexual dysfunction. It blew my mind that like, you know, how am I, you know, you think that you learned all about this in, you know, either high school, uh, med school, residency, but you don't, you know, you don't yeah. learn this until, you know, you seek extra research, you seek extra um, clinical information on this. So I think that it's very important to, you know, acknowledge all those factors, but the biopsychosocial approach is really how we look at dealing with a lot of these things and all of those impact how we look at and, and how we treat all these issues around sexual dysfunction. Oh, thank you. I so appreciate that. I, the biopsychosocial sort of construct, if you will, I, I first heard in speaking with you and listening to you. And I think it just informs sort of everyone's perimenopausal, menopausal experience if they kind of deep dive internally like, about that. Yeah, and I, yeah. I just, I really just so love that you you highlight that all the time. That is kind of the right. point in all the work that you do. Um, right. Dr. Ramon, tell us some of the primary reasons patients come to see you. Oh, for in my office, um, really they're vast. It's really so. Obviously, I focus on midlife women a lot. So there's issues around just generalized symptoms around menopause, whether it's hormone therapy, uh, you know, vasomotor symptoms, brain fog, all that stuff. So it's sort of the general menopausal stuff that's happening to them. But, um, you know, even specifically and within that, there's issues around um, sexual pain that I see a lot of patients for, pelvic floor dysfunction. I and mean, within sexual pain, there's so many aspects of looking at it. So we have sexual pain when it comes to um, initial and deep sort of penetrative pain. There's issues around the pelvic floor and, you know, vaginismus and how we have almost an anxiety reaction of the pelvic floor when it comes to sexual pain. There's issues even just looking at the vulva itself, right? There's issues around inflammatory skin conditions that can then cause either issues around the clitoris, clitorophimosis, um, things like lichen sclerosis that um, can cause issues around sexual um, uh, pain on entry because there's fissuring that happens at the opening. So there's that, there's recurrent vaginal infections that can happen with the changes in the vaginal microbiome within perimenopause and menopause. Um, and, you know, obviously issues around other medical conditions that then contribute to sure. inflammation, right? Endometriosis, fibroids, all that stuff. And we're learning more and more about endometriosis, the inflammatory <laughs> conditions around it and how it contributes to pelvic floor dysfunction and, you know, um, uh, uh, even superficial and deep dyspareunia. So there's, you know, tons of stuff that yeah. I see every day. I see patients that have persistent genital arousal disorder, which is sort of like not discussed as much, but I do see a lot of patients with that who have issues, you know, either, and, and, and nowadays we do a region-based approach to most issues around sexual pain or, or uh, any kind of genital pelvic dysthesia is what we call it. So there's end organ, there's, um, you know, the pelvic floor, there's the spine, there's the brain. So we have to look at all those issues around that too. Sure. Um, I just want to take you back to a few conditions that you mentioned, and I wanted to kind of highlight a few that you discuss in your content regularly. And you often make the connection between these conditions and this sort of cultural biopsychosocial piece. Um, so I wanted to give you opportunity to run through some of these. What is vaginismus? Am I am I saying that correctly? Sure. Okay. Yep. And, and is it, if you, once you get into it, I'm also wondering, is it hormonally related strictly or is it related to trauma? Is it related to all these other pieces sort of? Yeah. That you Absolutely. Mentioned? Yeah. I mean, it's all of the above really. I mean, vaginismus is um, traditionally like when we learned about sexual dysfunction in residency and medical school, that's all they told us. Oh, it's always vaginismus which is not the case. I think you know, our understanding has um, expanded exponentially. But vaginismus is an, in and of itself is truly, the, it's, a, it's a form of pelvic floor dysfunction 
but okay. specifically related to almost is an involuntary contraction of your pelvic floor. Like the thing that patients always tell me with vaginas, I'm trying to relax, but I can't help it. It's when you, and we grade it. Like there's either just a little bit of contraction of the buttocks or somebody that retreats all the way back to the exam table, but this happens involuntarily. And it's not, it's something that you try to control over time. I like to call it like almost an anxiety reaction to the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And it can be sort of secondary to a lot of things, right? So I have most of my patients that have untreated genital urinary syndrome and menopause oftentimes end up with vaginismus because they start trying to have sex and it's uncomfortable and it's uncomfortable. All of a sudden they can't get penetrated because they don't, they're not treating that vulvar vestibule, the opening that has lost estrogen and testosterone. Okay. And so when you have that happening, it just, you know, all of a sudden you're like expecting pain, expecting pain, expecting pain, and then you involuntarily mm -hmm. react. So okay. I do have patients who are peri post menopausal, um, post uh, partum, all of them that have vaginismus. Then you have patients that maybe have never had intercourse before, have been waiting, have been waiting, have been waiting, have it in their mind that they shouldn't have sex, they shouldn't have sex. And all of a sudden, they get into it with, um, you know, this involuntary contraction of the pelvic floor. And many times that's related to sort of the cultural and religious mm -hmm. baggage we sometimes carry around sexual identity. And then you also have um, patients who um, maybe, um, you know, have had experienced trauma, right? Like you've had uh, an experience where you had inappropriate touching or, or, you know, assault or whatever. And then all of a sudden your anticipation is pain and then you have an involuntary reaction. So that's kind of, and so, and, and so people with any type of sort of, you know, whatever trigger it is, if it's endometriosis and you're always clenching because you're in pain, so your pelvic floor becomes hypertonic, all of a sudden, you know, it builds up, that hypertonicity builds up to the point where you have an involuntary reaction now and you can't get penetrated. So it's on the spectrum of pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of an extreme part of it is where you can't actually achieve either it's it, pain with penetration or you can't even achieve penetration and, and so and where do you begin to treat that is that a um a pelvic floor is pt kind of remedy there are yes i mean that's a big primary player with pt i do have patients that you know also have had vaginismus or they would thought you know for the life of them their whole life they've had vaginismus but then maybe at the vestibule, the opening of the vagina. So the vestibule, I wish I had my vulva puppet. It's the I know, area I was, was going to ask you if you had your puppet. If I was in the, if I was, I'm not in the office today or I would have grabbed my vulva puppet. <laughs> next time, but next it's, time. <laughs> it's the area from the inner labia minora to the hymen remnant. And it extends from the posterior part of the vagina all the way to where you pee from. So there's a vulvar vestibule. It's kind of like bladder tissue. And so it has both estrogen and testosterone receptors there. But what happens is some people get like a nerve proliferation where they have tons of nerve endings at the vestibule and they can either happen at birth or it can happen um, uh, through like acquired inflammation. And over time, what happens is that uh, you can get vaginismus secondary to that as well. So when you start the process of evaluating vaginismus, a lot of times you can't even do an exam. Like sometimes I'll have patients and I'll tell them, I'm like, you know, we'll try if you want. If you want to do an exam, we can try they're like, I'm not in the headspace for an exam. We don't do it. So we just talk about, you know, a majority of what we do is talk about their history, the factors that might be contributing, where they've been, how many times they've attempted intercourse, whatever the case may be. But pelvic floor therapy is pretty much like a mainstay when it comes to treating vaginismus. Um, and then if you think about anxiety in general and how it's treated with cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the big things, I mean, I like to call them brain hiccups, right? When you have a hiccup in your brain, you can't turn it off. One way to do it is desensitizing, it's a desensitization therapy. And that's essentially, you know, how we try to approach the vaginismus aspect of pelvic floor dysfunction. And that's using dilators to not only sort of help stretch the area, but also desensitize you from the act of penetration, right? So there's that. And there's all the good things that pelvic floor therapists do when it comes to internal work. And I also have used Botox um, specifically for vaginismus. Um, you know, um, there was a, a great plastic surgeon who's now retired, Dr. Plasek. He came up with a vaginismus protocol for patients. And it kind of just depends on how extreme your case is. If you're just a little bit of vaginismus, sometimes dilator therapy, pelvic floor therapy, and, um, you know, sex therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy is enough. 
if it's, you know, if there's hormones involved, we treat that if there's, you know, so it's really a multidisciplinary approach. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, this is potentially sensitive. All of this conversation is, is, you know, can veer off into the uncomfortable for people. So I, I just sure. want to kind of let people know. Yeah. Uh, Trigger there. warning. Right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about female genital mutilation, which you've spoken about. Mm -hmm. And I also would love to focus on vulval lichen sclerosis and why it's often missed in women of color. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can start with the lichen sclerosis because sure. um, obviously, you know, I think that that is a very underdiagnosed condition in, in women of color. And because you know, when you learn about lichen, if you look at like the atlases of dermatologic skin conditions of the vulva, many times it's really just you um, looking at how the architectural changes happen in the vulva, the hypopigmentation, the um, maybe the the thickening of the skin, oh, all so of this what stuff. What is it? What is it exactly? Oh, lichen sclerosis. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Lichen sclerosis is an inflammatory skin condition of the vulva. And it's usually okay. a lifelong skin condition we think there's an autoimmune component to it that possibly, you know, there's a protein in, in the basement membrane of the, of the, of your, of your um, skin layers mm -hmm. that your body views as maybe foreign, right? And so then you have these inflammatory markers that come and start to act upon it. And with that becomes a ch the, the architecture of the vulva changes. So you get a thickening of the skin, right? Um, you can get changes in um, pigmentation, either, either hyper pigmentation some and 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 so again with women of color that might be confusing to some people is that some sure. people get diagnosed with vitiligo and it's really like in sclerosis right you just see oh there's some pigment changes must be vitiligo right. some patients have both actually they might have both um but uh you know looking around what's happening to the labia menorah the smaller lip the labia can sometimes regress and become smaller um they can also oftentimes disappear totally uh, and again, with the clitoris, with the skin becoming thick, it can get it can get hid under the hood, and you might not even see the body of the clitoris at all. So that's called clitoral phimosis. Hmm. Um, and so there's it's an auto uh, we think an autoimmune regulated condition where you know sometimes patients with other autoimmune conditions you know that might be a red flag. It used to be thought that it was more bimodal, where pre puberty and postmenopausal you'll get it more. Now I think it's like we're looking for it more. So we're seeing, I have a lot of 20, 30, 40 year old mm -hmm. patients with it. Um, so I think the, um, the geography of it is changing in some capacity as well. Um, and, and, uh, and with women of color, because there's so many shapes and sizes and colors that we see, oftentimes, again, there's not enough research done. There's not enough research yeah. done on women's sexual health in general, right? But if you compound that with the fact of our, you know, really ugly history when it comes to how we've dealt with, you know, enslaved women in the past and, and how women of color particularly have their own, um, you know, uh, they're, they're sort of have, you, you know, you have skepticism when it comes to research, when it, you know, if you're, if you're, if generationally you yeah. had, have had all this happening, then, um, you know, of course, you know, then it's hard to recruit patients for research, but Oftentimes it's not even, there's not even an attempt to recruit them. Yeah. So if we don't have the research and we don't have the data, I mean, I hate saying it all the time in my office, we just don't have enough research for X, Y, and Z to, you know, to say one way or another. Which is but, why your um, work is so important, by the way, right? Just to uh, right. back up that, it's critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think that, you know, with, with that, you know, we often misdiagnose patients with lichen sclerosis and they're not getting the appropriate treatment. There is a small percentage that can transform into vulvar cancer. And so that's why it's always important to do biopsies on these patients. I have a lot of patients that will never get a biopsy just by look, they'll get it. Um, but I always make it a habit of trying to do even just a small four millimeter pinch uh, uh, punch biopsies just to confirm that we're dealing, you know, visually it looks like lichen sclerosis to make sure there's no like, you know, precancerous lesions of the vulva. We don't want to miss that, especially for patients that have been years and years in this condition. So um, I think that, uh, you know, between that and not getting enough education when it comes to medical school residency, right? I mean, you've seen the statistics on how little we get with menopause and sexual dysfunction uh, in general. Um, and so you compound that with where, where are the women of color here? Where's the patients with the cultural differences? It's much, much less. 
And so, you know, I think that we have to really push for more research when it comes to all of these topics. But specifically, we need to look at some of the disenfranchised groups in the United States and see if we can, you know, really get to the bottom of why they experience sometimes worse symptoms, they're neglected the most, and they get the least amount of therapies offered to them. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ramon. I just want to pause just for a second. Um, we have some questions that have come in and I want to let those people know. I see your questions and I'm going to get to them. I don't want you to think that I'm not going to ask Dr. Ramon those things for you. Um, and I, I just want to mention a couple of other things. I'm conscious of our time. Um, I want to sidebar, if we can, female genital mutilation because you brought oh, yeah. up other oh, yeah. conditions. No, 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 not at all. Yeah. Um, and I, I just want to touch on those and also give you an opportunity to speak about a, a research paper that you co-authored that just sounded fascinating. So, but first, yes. if, if you could just speak a bit to superficial dyspareunia, I don't, I don't know if that ties into any of the other conditions you've mentioned so far, but I just want to oh, make yes. sure. Um, that just means pain uh, with sex on entry. So it's a descriptive okay. term. There is sort of an ICD, you know, 10 code for it that we use sometimes. Um, and so it's a descriptor, but doesn't really describe what's happening. I mean, it describes what's happening, but not the reason for it to happen, right? Okay. So superficial dyspareunia means that um, you're trying to get, have like um, traditional intercourse, penis and vagina, or, you know, using uh, toys and you can't, um, or you can do it, but it hurts on entry. So on entry, you're getting pain. And so that can be from a variety of reasons. Um, you know, we oftentimes call it provoked, and it's usually due to that vestibule again, the vestibule. And we oftentimes call it provoked vestibulodynia. So it's vestibule okay. is the part of the vulva that we're talking about. And the dynia means pain and provoked means something, you're trying to do something and it's happening to you. Okay. So provoked vestibulodynia is, is kind of equivalent to that. And, um, Usually the reasons for it, there's hormonally mediated, which means, you know, because that vestibule needs that estrogen and testosterone to make it healthy. There are patients that experience hormonal deprivation. We know that happens in peri and postmenopause, peri and postmenopause. That's something we already discussed, I think, um, a lot when it comes to the genital urinary syndrome menopause. I think we should call it the genital urinary syndrome of hormonal deficiency because there are other states that can bring us that. We talked about this at Ishwish last week, how that should be really the term that we use. But um, because postpartum women have diminished estrogen, right? And they also have this hormonal mediation, um, as well as um, women who, there's a subset of women who go on hormone birth control, hormonal birth control, oral birth control, that increases um, their, because it's metabolized to the liver, it increases their protein, sex hormone binding globulin, the SHBG. Um, and that protein binds to your testosterone and a subset of women, they get sort of this GSM like syndrome. And wow. it's a small, it's, it's not a large percentage of women on birth control. It's probably like less than 15%, but it still happens, especially if they start it really early, like when they're, you know, get, they get it because of pelvic pain or pain with their menstrual cycle. So there's that, there's the hormonal aspect. Then there's pelvic floor dysfunction. We know that if we're clenching, if we're anxious, if we're in pain a lot from other condi conditions, our pelvic floor muscles will start to contract and they'll get shortened and they'll get weak and they become hypertonic and they, you get trigger points in there just like you would any other muscle that's kind of contracted. Um, and that, because those muscles kind of feed into the bottom part of the vestibule, you end up with pain related or secondary to the, the pelvic floor dysfunction. And then you have inflammation and those nerve prolifer neuroproliferative reasons that I talked about. You get um, an increase in nerve density in the vestibule, even from birth or from inflammatory conditions, yeast infections, endometriosis, whatever the case may be. And it leads to this nerve proliferation that causes pain on insertion. Wow, and again, that's superficial, you know, and there's more I can say about it, but we don't have. A I'm sure. I'm, no, no, I'm sure. And I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I wanted to ask you quickly, does vaginal estrogen help to treat any of these conditions? Absolutely. Um, we know that estrogen receptors are, you know, in the vagina, they're in the vestibule. There's also testosterone receptors in the vagina and vestibule. So to say for some patients, vaginal estrogen isn't enough. So mm -hmm. if I could give everyone or put it in the water for every post or perimenopausal woman, I would put 
DHEA at 6.5 milligrams, which is the brand name of Intra Rosa. But DHEA is <clears throat> that um, <laughs> that suppository is unique in that it it changes at a cellular level in the vagina. It changes into estrogen and testosterone. And because it's a suppository, it leaks into the vestibule. So there's some new data to suggest that it can help with that initial penetrative pain too. Because a lot of times people don't get the best results with vaginal estrogen alone. Small subset, a lot of patients will, but we can then like um, use um, estrogen and testosterone at the opening that may help that as well. Because we can't discount testosterone. Testosterone is actually very much a big part of women's lives. And, uh, and I think that we don't, you know, we, we seem to segregate hormones in, in, in our yeah. culture, like testosterone, male, estrogen, female, but women really need that testosterone too. Thank you. Thank you and, for that. Um, before we get to questions um, from the chat, I, I did want to give you an opportunity to speak about this paper that you worked on. I believe it was in July of this past year. Is that correct? Oh, okay. Yes. yes. Sexual, um, it was published in Sexual Medicine Reviews, looking into yes. the dysfunction, sexual dysfunction of Muslim women around the world. Um, I'm just curious what your findings were. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because uh, I think in 2018, I did a paper just on the review of what are some of the sexual dysfunctions that Muslim women particularly experience. And the way I did that review was looking at different countries that are predominantly Muslim and seeing what their research is. And in the United States too, we just don't have a lot of it. Um, you know, we looked at all the things around vaginismus, unconsummated marriages, um, uh, looking at, you know, some cultures that have still are, you know, partake in female genital uh, cutting, um, some, uh, you know, issues around chastity and you know, um, the hymen and hymenoplasties and stuff like that. So I talked about all that in, in, in that one paper. And then we wanted to look at factors that are really contributing to sexual pain in Muslim women. And we saw that, I mean, if I could summarize it one word, I would say education, right? Like mm -hmm. one of the big leading factors that we're not seeing, I think in general for most people when it comes to sex ed, but all, specifically in some of the countries that predominate, predominantly are um, Muslim in origin, and I want to say that like traditionally, and I did, I did point this out in my paper uh, and I had great medical student Arlene Lambda that really led this um, paper, which I want to give her a shout out to because we, we don't do much without our good medical students. So, mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, that, you know, his traditionally Islam was a very sex positive religion. And so when um, a lot of this used to be discussed and this was like pre-colonialism, again, you know, all these cultural and political factors that have influenced how we look at sex. Colonialism is big when it comes to a lot of religions because there are a lot of puritanical values that were brought in. And so it used to be like really traditional times, people would talk about it like, you know, how do we pleasure women? Oh, you know, you can divorce your husband if you, you know, don't have good orgasms. These kind of things were really prevalent. Wow. Really. Um, and then it just shifted after colonialism, like so many things do. But um, <clears throat> I think that uh, one of the big findings was that you know, from a medical community, we don't have education, United States, other countries, you know, some clinicians are not comfortable speaking about sexual dysfunction. So there's that barrier. There's the patient barrier to understanding their anatomy. There's family involvement in a lot of these cultures, families like really deep rooted in a lot of the cultures. So the shame around, you know, um, sexual dysfunction, menstruation, all that stuff is so prevalent in some of the culture that, you know, it just transmits into generations. And there's still this lack of communication and lack of education that continued. And this kind of snowballs into all the problems that we are experiencing. And so that's why I'm always shouting about this yeah. because I think we have to educate everybody. We have to educate, you know, uh, people involved in, in, in medical care. We have to educate, you know, religious people. We have to, scholars, whatever. We, this has to be done um, so that we, and we have to understand our own anatomy, which, you know, most of us don't. Um, from a very early age understanding and we have to name the right anatomic parts right like this is something right. we don't do enough of when it comes to female anatomy mm -hmm. uh, I tell this funny story of the side that I took my kids to see the Barbie movie and mm -hmm. I had a four-year-old and 11-year-old girl and that scene where Barbie says you know when she comes to the real world a deep spoiler alert if you haven't seen it you know uh, I don't have a <laughs> yeah, vagina yeah. I don't have a vagina and he doesn't have a penis 
And then my four-year-old turned around and looked at me and said, but mama, we have a vagina. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. She's we well versed. Yeah. But of course, somebody walked up to me after. She goes, why did your daughter say that? Oh, and I'm wow. Like, uh, and I was like, well, you say nose, don't you? You say uh, eyes, you say finger, you can say vagina. It's a body wow. Part of it. Yeah. Wow. So Thank it's so embedded. That. That's a great, that's a great uh, kind of like, little little piece of a very big pond that's very telling uh, as to where we are and where we need to be. And Absolutely, uh, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Dr. Ramon, I wanna get to questions in our chat. Okay. Um, our first one is, hello, I'm 66 in menopause for probably 10 years. I've never had hormone labs done. Will getting them checked and possibly getting on a hormone regimen can it really help with dryness, libido, weight loss, mood, sleep? I just want to feel better or happier again. I want to go through life feeling good. Mm. Oh, yes. Absolutely. And you deserve to go through life feeling good. Mm. Like we're not, you know, just because you hit this peri state doesn't mean you're out to the pasture. Like we have a lot of ageism in our country that we need to fight too. But, um, uh, you know, checking hormones, you know, in the post menopause, you're, you know, however many years out, you know, it's probably going to show what we expect, which is, you know, low estrogen, low testosterone, high FSH. Um, and so that evaluation may or may not be part of it. It may be part of it when it comes to adding in testosterone, uh, which we have to kind of trickily do, because as I always say, the FDA, you know, hates women, they're not approving testosterone for us. So we mm -hmm. have to kind of work with male versions and titrate it to a level that will get us to premenopausal levels. Um, so that can definitely help a lot of patients when it comes to their libido, because at menopause, we lose 50% of our testosterone. So that is one thing, um, whether or not systemic hormones, you know, can help with all of that. Um, you know, definitely when it comes to vasomotor system symptoms, heart health, um, bone health, all of that stuff, you know, sometimes with energy, you know, depending on the patient, their medical conditions, obviously this is a very individualized healthcare approach that we use for patients at this period of their life. But def if, if you're the right candidate for systemic estrogen, plus or minus progesterone, um, you know, it can definitely help a lot of those symptoms. And when it comes to vaginal dryness and, you know, that um, entry pain, that superficial pain, um, let's not forget, I, I don't want to forget, because it's genitourinary syndrome menopause. I don't, I I don't want to underemphasize the fact that we experience much more UTIs when we lose estrogen, right? Estrogen is really important for decreasing the frequency of urinary tract infections. And so there's so many patients that end up, uh, you know, in their eighties with UTIs and then end up with, with urosepsis and they can actually die from this, right? So vaginal estrogen, I've said this in some of my YouTube videos, is life-saving for a lot of these patients. So we have to put in the estrogen to help with the bladder as well, the urgency, the frequency, um, but definitely it helps with, you know, dryness, people feel better overall and hopefully diminish their sexual pain. Oh, don't forget the pelvic floor muscles when it comes to if you've had longstanding sexual pain from vaginal dryness and lack of lubrication down there, then you have to address the pelvic floor. But you can definitely, there's definitely help for you. And you just have to find the right clinician who will listen and will care for what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, I, yeah, thank you for that. Um, our next question are any of the inserted battery or electric devices for pelvic floor exercises helpful? Um, I think that many of them are, you know, there's wands and other things that you can use to kind of like help to diminish um, uh, like any of the trigger points you might feel in the pelvic floor. Um, so some of that stuff at home is helpful. Sometimes, you know, even trying to strengthen your muscles by contracting around them, that's helpful. Uh, I think that it's, you know, if you can't see a pelvic floor therapist regularly, at least, you know, getting an initial evaluation and then seeing their suggestions. I mean, the pelvic floor therapists are miracle workers in so many ways, like to really help in that area. Um, you know, there's some that come with some vibratory sensations, you know, that might be helpful as well to increasing your sensation down there. There, um, uh, there's some, there's a, there's a dilator that's actually, um, electronic, but, uh, operated too. And it, it sequentially dilates. It's, it's from the, it's called Milli and it kind of sequentially dilates as well, instead of having to put in and put out a dilator. Um, so a lot of patients find that very helpful, but yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, 
Our next question. This I is, don't think it's a substitute for pelvic floor therapy, but if you can't get a pelvic floor therapist to help you out, it will definitely help. Great. Good, good to know. Thank you. Um, this is so fascinating. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. That's so kind to say. Um, how can you tell the difference between lichen sclerosis and GSM? Some, oh, wow, that's a good one. Sometimes they coexist, honestly. And so I, for a lot of my peri and postmenopausal patients, uh, if they have lichen sclerosis, they better be on that vaginal estrogen because it can mm -hmm. make symptoms much worse. But um, a lot of it is sort of the architectural changes uh, um, for really... Uh, and I can pick up subtle findings under vulvoscopy where I'm taking a magnifying magnifier, um, uh, basically like, and looking at the vulva very closely. But, um, you know, sometimes it's just how, you know, the skin can change, it can thicken, it can decrease pigmentation. You don't see as many pigmentation changes when it comes to genital urinary syndrome and menopause. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might see a little more pallor in the vagina. Um, you know, and, uh, you can see sort of the labia regress and kind of disappear, especially when you lose that testosterone in both scenarios, there is fissuring that can happen at the opening of the vagina for, um, both lichen sclerosis and general urinary syndrome menopause, if you don't have enough estrogen. So that, you know, can be a confounder potentially. That's why the biopsy is important, but otherwise, you know, um, you have to you have to treat both, and and I think the biopsy is really key. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Finally, um, oh, someone asked, what is the brand name of the DHEA vaginal suppository you referenced? Okay. And I have to say, I have no um, you know, financial affiliation with them. I just love the product, but it's yeah. called Intra Rosa. Intra Rosa. Intra Rosa. Okay. Um, I think I you can get it if you're if it's not covered by insurance, you can get it for eighty five dollars a month at at Costco, which is not great, but it's better than the uninsured price or a lack of insurance coverage price. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Um, I have HSV two, and I'm on suppressive therapy due to frequent outbreaks. I've tried estrogen cream for excessive dryness. It helped a little. However, it brought on outbreaks every time. Any suggestions? The dryness is so uncomfortable and I've avoided sex for two years and counting. Oh no, I'm so sorry about that. Um, I'm imagining that maybe your HSV is around the opening and that's potentially why. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, and, and I obviously don't know other history and other things that might be contributing. Um, vaginal estrogen or DHEA, you know, um, I think can be very beneficial and, and it's probably pretty still important for you to utilize. Maybe just, you're not using the right form of it for you. There's so many different types of vaginal estrogen. There's the cream, there's the, um, the soft gel, uh, that comes in four milligrams and 10 milligrams. There's the tablet that you can put in at 10. Um, you can uh, also utilize, like I said, the DHEA. There's an S string, an estrogen ring, which may be if your lesions are not at the opening, that might be something that you could utilize. It's a ring that you leave in for three months at a time. Um, there's an oral form of vaginal uh, that works for GSM symptoms, and that's called um, uh, aspemifene, and it's an oral pill that you take every day. Um, and basically it's, it's in the category of selective estrogen receptor modulators. And that means that at the level of the vagina, it gives, it's a pro estrogen, the level of breast, it's an anti estrogen, um, at the level of the uterus, it might be a weak estrogen, but, um, it is a very good product for some patients who maybe don't tolerate or able to do topical stuff. If you don't have any, um, contraindications. So it may be that you haven't found the right form for you that is not, um, that is causing, you know, the outbreaks to seem worse. The other thing is, uh, you know, that treats the symptoms of GSM when you're talking about other things that help hydrating the vagina, um, hyaluronic acid um, in uh, their suppositories and there's gels that you can utilize. That is very important. That's a vaginal moisturizer that you can use two to three times a week. Um, and then of course, lubricants when you're actually having sexual activity are important. Um, if it's been two years since you haven't had intercourse, I'd definitely say there might be a vaginismus component because of the fear of penetration with the pain of HSV plus the other stuff. So, um, I would say that when you get to someone that you can see, you know, make sure you address the pelvic floor as well. Dr. Ramon, I, 
I want to sort of give you, I want to kind of ask my last question just in case any other um, comments come in. Okay. I'm thinking about women who, for cultural reasons, religious reasons, family of origin, trauma, um, are remain hesitant even in midlife to walk into their gynecologist's office for, for starters, among any other practitioner, and say, I think something is going on with me and I need help. And I'm I'm wondering what you might offer sort of finally to those women in in encouraging them to to take steps towards their own healing. Um, and sort of be armed with information as they walk into that door. Um, so that's one thing. And, and then I'm thinking about the practitioner, your fellow colleagues who maybe, um, I don't know, I, I wouldn't even know, like feeling uneducated, wondering about something, suspecting something about a patient. And other than following you and connecting with you directly, sort of how they might begin to um, treat their patients better, as I'm sure that right. they do. Right, no, I mean, and this is a big problem, I think that I like to speak, you know, whenever I speak at conferences and stuff, I always include something about implicit bias. Most of my, um, uh, you know, um, case spaces, you know, are about women of color because I want that to be part of the equation. I don't, you know, um, ACOG came out with a statement this month about women uh, when it comes to, you know, you know, speaking specifically about OB um, um, maternal death and how it's three times higher in women and black women. And that we used to say race is a risk factor, but we have to call it what it is anti-black racism or you know anti-brown racism is the issue right this is the issue we're dealing with we're trying and and most of us you know uh you know we carry implicit bias and we don't realize it right so i always i have to point that out specifically that this is not just because it's not putting the onus on the patient you're brown and this is why it's happening to you no it's the system our system is broken and this is why it's happening to you that we are trained to I mean, I was talking to three of my um, uh, fellow OBGYNs that are also brown and and and, and Muslim or brown and Hindu or whatever, and they said, "Do you remember? Do you, were you a resident when they told you, hey, there's another brown patient in the room that won't let you examine her because she has vaginismus? Why don't you take care of it?" And every single one of us had a story from our residency where we were like, "Yeah," they were like, "What's the deal with your brown patients? What's the deal with those that Indian lady? What's the deal with that Pakistani lady?" Why is it that she won't let you examine her? And this is coming from an attending, right? These are usually like attendings, some of them, you know, men, some of them women. And you're like, this is what you're telling me. I'm learning this. And that some of us were like scared interns for the first time, didn't know how to respond to that. But that's implicit bias, right? That's in ingrained in them. They see a brown lady that can't have an exam and boom, you know, this is your culture problem. Yeah. No, it's yeah. your problem. It's your racism problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to call it what it is. Yeah. Like this yeah. is racism at its finest. And so I think that, you know, in, a, in, 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 in your own way, we have to be able to say like, and I have patients, I don't deliver babies anymore who I get pregnant. And so my black patients, I have been, they, they cry when they leave because they're like, how am I going to make sure someone listens to me? And I'm like, you call them out, call them out if you have to, like, we have to talk about it, what it is. Like, this is something ingrained in our system. It dates back to colonialism, to slavery, to all that stuff. And it's just continued. And yeah. so this is something we have to make sure that, you know, patients understand that this is not your, this is not your problem. This right. is not, this is not a, a it's not on you. yes, exactly. So that when it comes to clinicians, I'd like to say that like, we should really keep our mind open and, you know, open-ended questions, let a patient tell their story, don't interrupt them and say, oh, because you're black or brown or this or that, like this is why. No, you let them tell their story and you listen to them and you check your bias at the door if you can. I mean, we all have it. I mean, it's shown across the board. So we have to do that, number one, from clinicians. From a patient perspective, of course, if you're, you know, like you feel you feel shameful to bring it up or, you know, like I have this, I, have, I sometimes when people ask me, I'm always like, 
do you think I'm brave or do you think I'm shameless? Because like, you know, am I brave to talk about these issues as a brown Muslim woman or am I shameless? You know, it, it could probably go both ways depending on who's interpreting it. But, you know, you also have to understand that, you know, men will come and, and they'll get their Viagra and they'll get taken care of very easily. But who's having potential intercourse with these people? We have to address the, the, the women as well. That's how Ishwa started as a foundation. Like, you know, the men were getting their Viagra to Dr. Erwin Goldstein. What about the women? We have to own our own health. We have to be our own health advocate. And we have to tell, uh, we have to, we have to kind of even overcome the shame that we may feel. I used to feel shame too. Like, oh my God, I'm a gynecologist. And this is, but it's like, at some point you have to realize this is my body. I, I deserve better. I need better. Uh, I, you know, we, we're managing the world on our shoulders as midlife women, right? We have parents, we have kids, we have work, we have everything. And so we have to say like, if I don't take care of myself and take better, take on, take ownership of what's happening to me, um, then, you know, like I, I'm doing myself a disservice and everyone that depends on me. And so um, I, that's what I tell my patients who are kind of like hesitant to talk to me. Uh, most of the time, I think, you know, I give them such an open forum that eventually they will just, you know, but I think that, you know, you have to really say like, you know what, this is okay. This is, happens to almost every patient that goes through this. You are not alone. You are not broken. This is, this is mm-hmm. okay. And you need, you need to just tell us about what's happening. <laughs> Dr. Mom, <laughs> what a way to end this call. I, you are, you are an advocate. You are an educator. You are a physician, a clinician. Um, you, you are constantly highlighting and banging the drum on behalf of, um, and for women who've been so marginalized, um, not involved in the research, as you said, n- n- not treated um, well. And mm-hmm. I, I'm i so grateful and thankful Thank you to so you much. for joining us here. For you as well, Rachel. I'm so wow. thankful for your advocacy and all the work that you're doing you. as well. That's so, so kind. Um, Thank you for that. I, I want to also finally just remind anyone here that uh, this call will be up on our YouTube in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, and also remind you that Alloy is a place to land and get into these conversations as well with physicians who, like Dr. Rahman, are menopause trained. It's a science-backed, evidence-based platform and you can i want to remind you also enjoy twenty dollars off a purchase today on myalloy.com using the code info 20 dr ramon i just adore you i love 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 speaking with you i hope that we'll get to do it again thank you for all your work and um yeah, if there are a lot of questions that come up, we can we can do another one. I, I would love that so much. Um, thank you to everyone who came and, uh, you know, advocate, advocate. You can do it. You can do it. Yep. Thank okay. you so much. Absolutely.